Hi, I'm Chris Ebner. Um, I'm a fourth year architecture student with a minor in real estate and a concentration in furniture design. And um, I was on the same trip as Esteban to New Zealand, so some of this information might be a little bit repetitive, but I'll try and skip over the parts that he might have already talked about. Um, and this was over the summer of 2018. Um, so there were four of us who worked on a variety of projects throughout New Zealand. The other two there are two engineering students that we uh, got pretty close with. Um, and here, Esteban already gave you an introduction on who the Maori are, but they're just the indigenous people of New Zealand, um, and they have a significant stake in the social, cultural, and economic well-being of the country. Um, so I researched the evolution of the Maori built environment, particularly the development of the Whare Nui, which is their um, traditional meeting house, which is depicted on the bottom two images there. Um, so my first objective uh, was to compile an understanding of the traditional building history in New Zealand from the settlement of the Maori in the 1300s uh, through today, answering questions like uh, where did the Maori um, building practices come from, what materials did they use, how did they plan their villages, and if there were any uh, deeper meanings in the architectural um, terms architecture in terms of form, decoration, or use. Um, and then I wanted to determine what the impact of European colonization was on Maori architecture, um, basically looking at what, has, what changes have been made through European intervention, what stayed constant, um, how Maori architecture is viewed today, are the Marae used in the same extent that they used to be, and then what's driving this architectural change. So Esteban already probably talked about most of these terms. The most important one is the Whare Nui. Um, a quick distinction, the WH makes the F sound. So if you're confused, that's, that's what it's called. Um, and then the Whare Kai is the dining hall made of two um, main spaces. Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot to talk about the Whare Nui. Um, so there, the meeting house is basically intricately carved. Um, gable roof uh, with a porch on the front, a door, and a window very low walls, and interiors are decorated um, in a variety of manners, primarily with carvings and woven panels called tuku tuku panels. Um, so I began my research with a literature review, compiling all the knowledge I could find on early Pacific building practices from Australia to Samoa. Um, I conducted a series of interviews with professors at the University of Auckland, as well as a a variety of community members from a variety of Maori communities across the country. Um, and by speaking with the local community members, I was able to get a brief history of their personal um, whare nui, sort of how it was built, um, what, how many, what different design iterations it went through, um, and then different renovations that have happened throughout time. Um, and these sites, site visits were particularly, particularly useful in uh, documenting these building practices as well as various elements of architecture that had been introduced by uh, Europeans when they came and settled in the late 1700s. Okay, so as far as the building history goes, a lot of the um, Maori early settlements and their buildings were uh, built in a similar way to that of settlements and uh, cultures in Polynesia, Micronesia, and Melanesia across the Pacific, um, primarily wood construction with uh, joints tied together with um, reeds or vines, as you can see in the image on the far left. That's a, the Somo and Fale compared to the um, Maori Whare Nui. Um, and there are certain sim uh, similarities between the two of these, um, as you can see. Um, on an urbanistic scale, the time before European rediscovery was characterized by the Pa, which is basically the image in the, on the top right or the defensively ringed um, palisade that sort of def uh, protected the city from other warring tribes and within which most of the whare of the Maori um, were located. Um, so traditional Maori architecture has been dominated by, as I said earlier, the form of the low-walled semi-subterranean house with a rectangular plan, the front uh, porch, a gable roof, and a single window and door. But when Europeans brought Christianity, um, they introduced the Gothic church architecture, which greatly influenced many of the Maori's pr uh, preliminary buildings, um, inspiring taller spaces, steeper roof pitches, um, and additional windows on the side to let more light in. 
and then oh, and then the uh, finding that we see all across New Zealand today are results of sort of a combination between the European introduction with Gothic architecture and what was existing prior to that. But it took over 150 years to bring about the native architecture that we recognize today. Um, and throughout that time, the Maori struggled to find an architecture that would allow them to keep their cultural identity without feeling like their culture was a thing of the past. Um, regardless, elements and customs surrounding the Whare Nui are continually changing, and this can be attributed to health and safety requirements, availability of building materials, um, progressive versus traditional views on, of different demographics, and rural or urban population shifts. Um, so this is basically what uh, we did whenever we went to the, the sites. Uh, we met with the Marae members, we integrated the community perspectives um, into a restoration of the heritage architecture, attempted to develop understanding of Maori building techniques, and then interviewed community members um, about the Marae history, particularly pertaining to the Whare Nui. So this is the first site, or one of, uh, one of the sites that we went to. Um, I saw Esteban's presentation had uh, mostly to do with Pyro, so I'll skip over this one briefly. Um, but some of the major interventions that the European um, sort of uh, brought into this were more window lighting in the back, um, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems within the building, and then a new developed sense of um, structure um, to comply with building codes. Um, so Pipiriki, this is the Parawaka Marae in Pipiriki. Um, and we were involved in a community meeting about possibly expanding the facilities and trying to create ways to draw back younger generations to the um, Marae through the architecture. Um, and so this has been sort of a trend of the past 10 to 20 years where smaller Maori communities have seen the youth of their communities leaving, going off to larger cities like Auckland and Wellington to uh, go to school and then get jobs from there. Um, but in Piperiki, the community members wanted to create a way to bring people back into um, the Maori cultural tradition of um, living and um, using this marae. So this is the marae at the University of Auckland. It's right in the middle of the city. Um, from a different camera, camera angle, you can see the uh, skyscrapers behind. Um, but this is where we um, got an introduction to Maori customs and practices, basically. Um, and then this is the Piritahi Marae on Waheke Island. And this is where we had our uh, first opportunity to spend the night in a marae. We were welcomed uh, by the locals there, and we were actually allowed to stay there. Um, this is an interesting case where you can actually see pretty clearly the uh, necessary interventions that were required by code including that window in the back over, or the door in the back here for egress purposes, and then windows all along, along the walls. But they blended it pretty well together with um, traditional practices like the tukutuku panels, the carvings, and then the painted motifs across the ceiling. All right, so my findings. Um, so I sort of looked at how um, the, or I wanted to see if the Maori, if the Whare Nui had reached its peak as an architecture form. Um, but I found that it hasn't really reached an uh, architectural zenith, nor has it lacked development. It's sort of evolved over time, um, and that it's recent enough that it's not yet become a building type of the past, much like a lot of other um, architectural forms that we see today. Um, this makes Maori architecture unique and of particular architectural importance. Um, it's also unique in that it's reliant on the influence of two different uh, independent and opposing cultures. Um, it's been boosted by and draws from Western architecture in an attempt to create an, a unique um, form, but due to its situation both within the Maori and the European culture, um, it's destined to be in sort of this architectural limbo. Um, so a lot of, uh, Esteban alluded to the same uh, similar point, but our architecture program here at Notre Dame focuses on creating sustainable designs utilizing traditional building methods and for this reason, I think studying Maori indigenous architecture has the potential to become quite influential in my coursework over the next few years. As an indigenous culture, the Maori have cultivated and established a sustainable and resilient built environment, which is fundamentally tied to the guardianship of their land for future generations, a mindset known as kaitiakitanga. This commitment to sustainable architecture is a practice that should be modeled beyond the small island in the South Pacific, eventually becoming an inherent aspect of the way any architect designs. 
these are the, all the organizations that helped make this possible. Um, list of references. Questions? Okay, so uh, when you're going to these different buildings, um, like a lot of them seem to have like, there's like a lot of diversity within them. And so are there any, I guess, large continuities that you see between all of them in terms of just like, I guess, defining the, the type that is the building besides the front facade, like what is it about on the inside that really? Um, so inside you've got all of these different um, elements as you can see here. So the, one of the characteristics of this vertical pole called the Potakamanawa um, they've got these ridge poles that run across this main beam. Um, and one of the more interesting things that I found in my research was that the Fata Nui itself is supposed to represent an ancestor of that tribe. Um, so the poles here would represent the heart, this ridge um, pole across the, across the peak um, is the spine. On the front, um, the two arms here, the barge boards are the welcoming arms. This is the face of their ancestor. Um, so it has a lot of um, symbolic and cultural influ uh, meaning within the architecture itself. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.